So this destabilization within the drug trade itself um, contributes to inter-cartel violence. Um, and so you you do see um, the the kind of situation in which there are quote unquote warring cartels struggling over territory as um, a kingpin is taken out and um, people attempt to regain control. But um, so this situation of destabilization within the cartels itself leads to the announcement by Felipe Calderon in 2008 of his war on drugs and organized crime. Now, it's important to note here that this is done in conjunction with the United States from the very beginning. Um, in late 2007, the Bush administration negotiates the Merida Initiative, a security agreement with Mexico, which is intended to combat drug trafficking both within Mexico and across the U.S. border. So when Calderon announces this war in late 2007, 2008, it is always already a U.S. and Mexico joint war. Um, what's notable about this fact is that it's only after the creation of this militarization strategy that violence, and especially what are called drug-related homicides, begin to spike in 2008. So in late 2007, Bush goes down to the Yucatan Peninsula. They do this. They hold these meetings in Merida, which is this beautiful colonial city, um, and they do this incredible thing where they wall off 40 square blocks of the city with a huge wall, keep protesters out. The negotiations go on inside. It's um, very much kind of the the drug war in microcosm, the building of the wall and the security apparatus sort of sitting inside it, um, and. It is only after this militarization strategy is announced and the, the military really goes in to begin to combat these cartels in this way that there is this surge in violence. Um, and so the militarization, what, what happens here is that the militarization of state efforts to combat drug trafficking elicits a parallel militarization on the part of the cartels and ramps up the power of forces such as the Zetas, um, who em emerged as a kind of paramilitary style group of assassins for hire, drawn from state military forces in Mexico and Guatemala, um, what was a kind of group of just um, assassins that could be hired by other cartels eventually become a cartel in their own right. They become, they begin to actually control territory and move drugs. And now we're seeing them moving into other kinds of economic activities as well that I'll talk about a little bit, a little bit later. Um, so it's really this confluence of economic devastation in the countryside post NAFTA and the rise of the drug trade that means that by 2008, the narco economy is Mexico's fifth largest employment sector. And that is behind um, a number of delineated sectors of kind of light manufacture. So numbers one through four are manufacturing in things like textiles and um, canning and other kinds of light manufacture. The fifth largest employment sector in Mexico by 2008 is the drug trade. Um, and this means that in the main, these people are kind of low-level workers, right? The fifth largest employment sector means that they're not all drug kingpins by any means. They're low-level employees. They're runners and lookouts and security and growers and service workers working in the narco economy. And in many places in Mexico, jobs with the cartels become the only means to put food on the table. And so, of course, it's these people and their families and their neighbors who make up this 100,000 dead and nearly 30,000 forcibly disappeared. Poor Mexicans trying to earn a living in what is often the only viable industry in the place that they live. And the people who live around them, um, their mothers, their children, their aunts and uncles. Um, so important, I, I also want to point out here, it's important that this kind of disintegration of the pre as the absolute power um, doesn't end the corruption of the political and security officials in the employ of the cartel. It just spreads it to the other political parties as well, right? So we should remember, of course, that the local and state officials who've been charged in the Ayotzinapa case for their connections to drug trafficking are from the supposedly left PRD. Um, so rather than the kind of Pax Priista that existed before, we have a war in which members of all political parties are actually imbricated with the cartels. So after this surge in violence during the Calderon administration, Peña Nieto comes to power vowing to, vowing to end what he sees as the failed security strategy of his predecessor. What he proposes in its place, however, is a series of market-based reforms intended to target those sectors that had not yet been fully neoliberalized, especially education, telecoms, and crucially, energy. 
So I'll turn now to the reforms that Peña Nieto um, has been putting in place over the last couple of years and um, what these reforms really have to do with the moment of Ayotzinapa. Of course, after the Calderón sexenio and, and these stagger, the staggering violence, many Mexicans were with good reason frightened um, and tired by the time of the 2012 election. And over the course of the Calderón presidency, Mexico had become a country seen as being um, sort of made up of out of control violence. And this violence is actually fueled by the state and by US support. Um, and actually the state violence, particular incidences of state violence are almost always the spark for the various resistance movements that emerged in the mid 2000s. And I think it's important to note these um, various resistance movements and I'll just gloss on some of them very briefly um, because it's not as though um, the people of Mexico have just sort of thrown up their hands and let this happen. Um, this, this resistance that happens is frequently led by, um, by unions and especially by dissident unionists, such as those in, as in um, Sección 22 of the um, Dissident Teachers Union. The, the official teachers union, um, which, is long been, which was formed in the late 1940s and has long been a sort of pre-political machine, is actually the largest trade union in Latin America. It has 1.4 million members. It's an enormous union. But because it has been so imbricated in the pre's political structure, um, there emerged, especially in these political struggles of the 1980s, dissident factions within it. And so there is, um, there is another, um, the, the acronyms, the, the official union acronym is SNTE. There is the dissident union is the CNTE, the Coordinadora. And um, this dissident union um, has been involved in quite a bit of activism, in especially in southern Mexico in the course of the 2000s. One important um, Ask, one important uh, event that happened in, in 2006, the, the, these teachers from the dissident faction were on strike as they had been basically every year when their contract expired to try and get, um, try and get wage hikes. And they were actually violently, um, violently uh, evicted from their planton by the, by the um, state security forces in 2006. And in response, there is organized um, the creation of the APO, the Popular Assembly of the Peoples of Oaxaca, which actually organized a kind of parallel power structure to the corrupt state and local governments. And um, in doing so, followed some of the lessons of the Zapatista uprising in, since 1994 in forefronting indigenous rights and governance by usos y costumbres, longstanding indigenous justice practices. Practices. So the APO really emerges in Oaxaca in 2006, as um, a lot of people are looking to it as a kind of alternative governance structure to the corruption of the state. Um, in that same year, in 2006, state security forces also killed two protesters in San Salvador Atenco, um, a municipality in Mexico State where Enrique Peña Nieto was actually the governor. And Atenco had been the site of um, an earlier struggle in 2002 when the Mexican government tried to evict um, a series of um, um, indigenous landholders from their land to build a new airport for Mexico City. Um, and they resisted that. And so the, the 2006 struggle was, was somewhat in the aftermath of that. And in this struggle, two protesters are killed. <laughs> so that actual, that resistance in Atenco is actually crucial for the first big movement that emerges in opposition to Peña Nieto's candidacy for the presidency, right? He's the state governor at that point. But Atenco becomes a flashpoint when he starts running for president. Um, and this, the first big resistance to this is the Yo Soy 130 movement, um, and this is a student movement. So this movement emerges during his campaign. Peña Nieto um, had an event at what is the relatively conservative and wealthy private Ibero University in Mexico City. Um, and at this, at this event, which was supposed to be a kind of uh, friendly audience for Peña Nieto, a series of students questioned him about the killings in Atenco. And he responded that he, he, um, he did what was best and that he would do it again if necessary. Um, and when this incident was reported in the Mexican news media, it was reported um, very much taking up Pri and Peña Nieto's line that the people who had questioned him at this event at the Ibero were not students, they were outside agitators. They had been sent by the other political parties, they were not Ibero students, and that this was um, sort of the other political parties attempting to undermine him. So in response, 131 of these students made this video where they held up their Ibero identification cards and said, I am an Ibero student and I questioned Peña Nieto, and this sparked the movement, um, Yo Soy 132, I am the 137 second student, meaning I join with these students in their, in their resistance. Um, 
this student movement is important to note here because it began to build um, solidarity uh, across universities with a new generation of university students and sort of between those universities and left groups in Mexico that would then be reactivated in the moment of the Ayotzinapa crisis. So when Peña Nieto assumes the presidency on December 1st, 2012, declaring this is Mexico's moment, um, he did it once again, and this is a trope, inside a walled off building surrounded by police keeping out, surrounded by riot police keeping out the thousands of protesters outside. Um, and there were scores of arrests during his inauguration, um, and these kinds of protests continued um, from the Yo Soy 132 movement and other social movements in Mexico City um, over the course of the um, over the course of the Peña Nieto administration thus far. Um, so the centerpiece of Peña Nieto's administration has been a reform package known as the Pacto por México, the Pact for Mexico. And this pact, in fact, has been cemented by an agreement between three major political parties, the PRD on the left, the PAN on the right, and Peña Nieto's PRI, to push forward these further neoliberalizations. Um, I should note here that the PRD is controlled currently by a conservative faction known as the Chuchos, who lean heavily to the center and who have bought wholesale into these reforms. In fact, the party's most visible representative, Guatemoc Cardenas, um, who was that challenger in the 1990, uh, 1988 fraudulent election, um, he publicly left the PRD after the Ayotzinapa crisis, declaring it sort of morally bankrupt. And I I'm sure this is something that Daniela is going to go into further, talk talking about the political repercussions of this. Um, but it's this pact between the nominal left, right, and center parties to push these neoliberal reforms through the legislature that completely forecloses any electoral possibility for opposition um, and leaves really taking to the streets as the only means of registering resistance to these reforms. And the resistance was massive and constant, particularly in the realms of education and energy. The Ayotzinapa students themselves were involved in resisting a technocratic overhaul of education based on standardization and testing and the implementation of computer systems, which are very much in line with the changes to education here in the United States. Um, to actually signal his intention to go after the power of the teachers union um, and to, to sort of um, to enhance his legitimacy after having been elected by only 38% of the, the, the voting population. Peña Nieto's first real move once he's in office is to oversee the arrest of Elba Estergordillo. The, uh, she's called La Maestra. She's the head of this huge teachers union that had for so long been a pre-political machine. She's arrested on corruption charges. She's actually at her private home on an island off Southern California here when this happens. Um, she, is a, she is a ferocious politician and uh, an incredible incredibly rich woman. Um, and so Peña Nieto demonstrates his legitimacy and there's a long history in Mexican politics of when a new president takes office doing something spectacular like this um, to sort of prove their legitimacy. And so La Maestra becomes, she is forced to kind of fall on the sword for Peña Nieto to prove how serious he is about his reforms. Um, so included in this package of reforms are tax reform, financial reform that allows banks to actually repossess um, for non-payment of debts for the first time ever in Mexico, this education reform, some labor reforms that actually can lower the hourly wage at the border in these maquilas to 75 cents an hour and limit access to the Mexican social security system, um, and then energy reforms that will privatize aspects of the state-owned oil company, Pemex, and the electricity system, at political reform of elections, and finally the ongoing reform of the telecom sector. So these reforms earn Peña Nieto wild approval in the foreign financial, in the eyes of foreign financial analysts. And he's put on the cover of the international edition of the February 2014 Time magazine with the headline, Saving Mexico. How Enrique Peña Nieto's sweeping reforms have changed the narrative in his narco-stained nation. And changing the narrative, I think that it's really important that Time put it this way, because changing the narrative, I think, is at the core of Peña Nieto's strategy, because it is a strategy that is intended to boost investor security and not the physical or economic security of the Mexican people. He has continued the kingpin strategy of taking out leaders of the cartels, including the rearrest of Chapo Guzman, um, which, as we've seen, has only led to fracturing and more violence. He's continued with the Obama administration, the Bush Calderon era Merida initiative, which to date has allocated some $3 billion in equipment and training for Mexican security forces. So 
Peña Nieto's intention was really to declare to the world of international finance that Mexico was not an out-of-control narco state, but rather a sound investment opportunity, to be made more sound by his reform agenda. Indeed, in August of 2014, just a month before that fateful night in Iguala Guerrero, Peña Nieto took to the op-ed pages of the Financial Times, right, the New York, the Wall Street paper, to crow about the legislative success of his reforms, which, among other things, will have begun to privatize Pemex and the National Electricity U Utility, as I mentioned. So it's in this context, the foreclosed electoral political space, continued US investment in the war on drugs, and the opening to foreigners for the first time since 1938 of, Mexican oil, of the Mexican oil sector that Ayotzinapa takes place. This, this context, I think, is the reason for the continued silence about Ayotzinapa in Washington. What could be more destabilizing to Peña Nieto's strategy insistence on investor security than a reprimand from the State Department from Washington? Um, so instead, the U.S. government wanting to keep the markets stable, wanting to keep investment in Mexican oil, Mexican banking stable, um, has issued only platitudes of continuing support, including continuing the Merida Initiative. So, of course, as, as we look back, if, as we begin to bring this back to the United States, as we were asked to do, it's important to ask, as any good historian or journalist would, um, who benefits from this U.S. continued support? And um, this is something that I do with students when I travel around lecturing about this. I always ask them who benefits. And it's interesting to see what, what students come up with for this. Um, because there are, of course, many forms. The answers to this come in many forms. But um, I want to particularly touch on the benefits accruing to both transnational capital and the US political class. The drug trade in the United States sends something like $30 billion a year in sales back to Mexico, and the global trade is something like $100 billion a year. So it's that $30 billion worth of drugs that we here in the United States buy to use recreationally, um, people who are addicts, it's that $30 billion that has been so corrosive to the political system in Mexico. But the beneficiaries, of course, are not all illicit. And this is the thing that always surprises students when you talk to them about this. The beneficiaries of the drug trade um, are not all illicit. And actually, the boundaries between licit and illicit within this um, circulation of capital, of course, are increasingly blurry, not only as the cartels begin to take new enterprises on. Um, beyond sort of drug trafficking, of course, there is also extortion and kidnapping, which are beginning to account for a higher and higher percentage of drug cartel revenues. But actually, we've begun to see cartels move into other industries like logging and mining, sending the kind of illicit gains from those to, um, to foreign markets, particularly in Asia. And so um, in that way, I think there's actually some, um, the, the cartels themselves are acting as any good transnational capitalist would and sort of diversifying. And that diversification means, of course, um, increasing cartel control of more and more industries and increasing violence for people who have jobs in industries that were previously not touched on by the narcos, right? Um, so in some places, so that's that's sort of one one way in which um, there there is benefit to transnational capital. But um, in some places, the very violence of the drug war itself has been has benefited transnational capital, as in Ciudad Juarez, where the geographer M Melissa Wright has tra cr traced a kind of accumulation by dispossession, resulting in the gentrification of neighborhoods so racked by violence that they become abandoned, only to be bought up by transnational real estate firms and populated by big chain stores like the supermarket chain owned by Carlos Slim rather than the family-owned businesses that were there before. And so in, in northern cities like Juarez that have been so devastated, you've actually seen the complete evisceration of neighborhoods and then they're being bought up by transnational real estate firms with their um, headquarters in Houston um, and they have views straight over the border um, and you are creating these sort of new zones of malls and gentrification within Ciudad Juarez as a direct result of the violence of the drug war. Um, and then, of course, there are the banks. A UN expert argued in 2008 during the financial crisis that the only actual liquid capital in the banking system keeping the entire world financial system from grinding to a halt was drug money. The few cases of censure that have occurred for banks that have been caught laundering money, HSBC, Wachovia, um, the fines that have been levied against them are a drop in the bucket compared to what they're making by laundering this money for the cartels. There are actually instances, there are instances where 
the the windows, the teller windows at Mexican banks have been widened so as to accumulate the suitcases of cash that are being deposited. And so when banks are caught doing this, they are slapped with a fine that is some tiny proportion of what they're actually making off of this. And that money continues to circulate in the global financial markets. And as this UN analyst said, is some of the only existing liquid capital not sort of bound up in fixed assets um, that existed in, in that 2008 moment of financial crisis. But then, of course, there are their direct political beneficiaries. When billions of dollars are appropriated under things like the Merida Initiative, that money, of course, is not dispersed to the Mexican government, right? Barack Obama doesn't write a check to Enrique Peña Nieto and hand it over and let him spend the money. Um, no, that, that money never leaves the United States. So some of the funds go to underwrite training programs run by government agencies, like the Department of Justice's Project Diamante, like things like um, the Fast and Furious, the, these, these kinds of programs are all funded through this, um, but also training for Mexican security security forces um, at places like the Department of Defense's Western Hemisphere Institute for Security and Cooperation, formerly known as the School of the Americas. The bulk of these funds from the Merit Initiative, however, goes to firms like Sikorsky Aircraft in San Diego, I mean in, in Stanford, Connecticut, which builds Black Hawk helicopters, and General Atomics in San Diego, which builds the Predator drone used for border surveillance. So in, in those places, in places where this money, these appropriations for the drug war are actually being spent on defense contracts, um, politicians such as Senator Richard Blumenthal, the Democrat from Connecticut, or former Representative Buck McKeon, the Republican from here in California, have a political interest, of course, in increasing government contracts for the firms, not only to maintain the jobs that they bring locally, but also to keep their campaign war chests full with contributions from the firm's political action committees. And so the amount of money that General Atomics um, gave to the re-election of Buck McKeon is something that is actually traceable and is, is sort of right there to demonstrate how this benefits um, the U.S. political class. So this, I, I'd argue, is the context in which the United States government supports a violent and upwardly redistributive status quo in Mexico. As such, I think these are the points at which activism here in the United States can and should be targeted. In so doing, U.S. activists have been and should continue to join the, that untiring resistance of the parents of the Ayotzinapa students in their insistence, fue el Estado, it was the state. Just as they know, we know too, and we must refuse to let Peña Nieto's attempt to change the story, to really whitewash these imbrications of neoliberalization and violence succeed. We must continue the pressure in solidarity with the people of Mexico on our own political system here at home. Thanks. survey of what's been happening uh, in, in a longer run and